to this meeting, and I'm sure lots of you know Doug better than I do. I know Doug through Hill and Holler News, and that's something that I look forward to. So, Doug, it's yours for two hours or four hours or 45 minutes. We're glad to have you. I did it for the society about 12 years ago, I believe. The historical societies of this area and of the entire nation have done a great piece of work in establishing markers and uh, preserving history and establishing uh, bits of, of law folklore and things in the area that they represent. These are concrete and tangible things that, uh, and bits of history that must be preserved. However, today for a little while, I want to talk with you about the intangible, something that's not easy to find, an indestructible philosophy of the Ozark Mountain people. Now, I wouldn't want to try to talk about history because there are people here that know too much about it. They'll call your hand on the date or something. And I just don't like to try to talk about history. But I like to talk about the philosophy of the people that I grew up with and love in these hills. These pioneers had a philosophy of life, probably unaware of, a, of it as such. This enabled them to withstand the hard times, sickness, death, drought, wars, pestilences. They, they had this, this belief and this philosophy that would see them through the rough places. Now many of us in this room, uh, I know from my notes here I said 60 years and over, but I should say 70 years and over because I'm past that now. But it, most of us older ones in this room, we are the last connecting generation between the one living generation now at the, this new generation and the old way of life. And as we stand at some point of a past midway in the station of lifespan, we turn to look back on our early youth and we can see the campfires, the wagon freighters. We can see the old blacksmith shops. We see the farmers in the field with their sighs. We can hear the ringing of school bells in 75 rural school districts in Taney County alone. We recall with a lot of pleasure the names of some of those, like Loafer's Glory, Possum Trot, and Dirt Dog, those interesting names that grew up. Then we turn towards the present. We look about us and we see the roads with the fine cars, the jet planes overhead, and the air disturbed with sonic booms and TVs and neon lights flashing. Then we know, really and truly know, that we have lived in two distinct generations. And now as I look back on the pioneers that I knew and I recall their sayings and their stories, their music and their songs, their sermons and their prayers, I am well assured that these dear people had a philosophy of life, had a wonderful philosophy of life. So firsthand from my experiences with these people that I learned from teaching rural school running for county office, uh, serving as a county official, uh, practicing law in a little country law office. From first hand, from my experience with these dear people, I want to give to you my feeling on what this philosophy of life is for the Ozark pioneer people. What was this inner force that enabled them to carry on in spite of all the problems and hardships they had? I say first was patience then endurance, then a quick retort or quick comeback 
and independence and making the best of any situation with a good sense of humor, resourcefulness, and last but not least, a firm belief in the Creator of the Lord our God. Now these little stories uh, that I tell you, and I, I'll limit this because we've been here now about an hour and a half, and I won't try to cover all that I have here, but I want to hit the high points of what I think is the the philosophy of the Ozark Mountain Pioneer. Now, for instance, we talk about patience. When I was county clerk, Uncle John Hayworth was a presiding judge, and he was uh, one of the first Democrats ever elected in this county. And he was a fine old Christian gentleman, a Baptist preacher, and uh, there was a road problem that came up. A fellow had to put a fence across a road down in the rural area, and so uh, the two county court members uh, said, let's go send the sheriff out and tear that gate down. And Uncle John said, just a minute, fellas. He said, let's talk with him first. He said, you know, you can toll a man further with a piece of cornbread than you can drive him with a Winchester rifle. <laughs> then I recall uh, the later years, uh, George Blankenship had a filling station at Forsyth. And George didn't talk very plain, but he was a hard worker and ran this filling station, had a little record service. And a wealthy man from Chicago, God bless him, come to this country to help us make it beautiful. Anyway, uh, this wealthy man had, uh, had was building a beautiful home over there on Bull Shoal Flame. And uh, he had worked, uh, had a fine business in Chicago and was used to telling people just what to do and when to do it and all that. So uh, he tried to take that same attitude here with our hill people. And this little, this is an instance of what happened. Uh, it's been a lot of rain, and one morning down in George Blankenship's little filling station, the phone rang, and uh, George said, Hello. And he said, I want you, I've got my Cadillac in the ditch up here, and I want you to come down and get it. George said, Okay. He said, Now I want you to come right now. I said, You know who this is talking, don't you? It's R.G. Smith. He said, Yep, I know who it is talking, all right, Mr. Smith, but that don't make no difference. It's going to be a wet or while. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, we're talking about the patience of our people. Uh, a man by the name of Hobbs had the first store at Long Run in Ozark County, and he uh, had a store and a mill, and there was no post office there. But finally, he got a post office established at Long Run, and still a post office there, still a store there. But Uncle John's been gone many, many, many years. But now, uh, the the salesman in those days came with a hack and their samples, and this Keaton Roundtree dry goods salesman came to the store and put all the samples out on the table, and Uncle John was looking at those, and he, he bought a bolt of calico and a bolt or two of gingham and some muslin and some denim and, and uh, different things, and there was two bolts of silk. And Uncle John ran his hand over that, and he said, that's pretty stuff, he said, I believe we'll take a bolt of that young man hesitated a little, the salesman, he wrote it down. He said, well, said, that's pretty stuff there. I'll take a bolt of that, too. And in the young salesman, a little worried, he said, now, Mr. Hobbs, he said, we sell quite a lot of that in Springfield and the largest places, but said, uh, have you had any calls for that down here in the long run? No, hell no, but I didn't have no call for the mail till I put in the post office. <laughs> Then we talk about the endurance of the, of the pioneer people. Uh, Uncle Dave Smith was a character who lived down South Bee Creek in the county, and he'd go over to Harrison quite often, and one, and he liked to drink, and he got over there and got drunk one time, and they put him in jail. And a few days later, the fellows loafing on the, the uh, Newton Crumpler store porch looked down the road and saw Uncle Dave walking back from Harrison. They knew he'd been in jail, but they didn't say anything about it because it was sort of a disgrace to get in jail in those days. So he uh, he said, uh, they said to him finally, he said, well, Uncle Dave said, how did you like it down there at Harrison in jail? He said, I didn't mind it much. Said they had such good strong coffee down there. <laughs> One time Bob Gideon and I were sitting, we're still talking about the endurance of our people. We're sitting in a, a law office and discussing a family of people, and I'm not mentioning any name, but uh, I might get shot or sued, but anyway, they were known as fighters, and him and Adam know what I'm talking about, and they were really scrappers, and fight fair or any other way, and so uh, we were talking about this family, and, and this old man sitting there by the name of Kazee, and he said, 
Yeah, I said, I know them. Said, the worst fight I ever fit was with one of them, those SOBs down in front of my store at Pro Tem. Said, he wrenched around me and stopped me in the back three times before I could get my nucks out. <laughs> Now, uh, I like to think about, it. I've, just, I've just written a story for the Hill and Holler about the quick comeback of the Ozarkian. And this, uh, this is an old story I've told so many times, I'm almost ashamed to tell it, but uh, some of you haven't heard it, so we'll tell it again. I was teaching rural school at South Beak Creek, and in those days, uh, the Arkansas people only had about a five-month school, and we have eight-month school in Missouri. When the Arkansas school was out, along the schools along the border, many times these young youngsters would come over into Missouri to get the, uh, the other month or two of education, so-called. Anyway, uh, one day I was right on the Arkansas border, and the Beat Creek was almost the dividing line between the states. I got to school one March morning, and the school was out over Dayberry in Arkansas, and I looked coming across the footbridge, there was three boys stair step size. They, uh, they came in and, and I uh, rang the bell for books as we called it. And the boys took their seats and I got the old teacher's register out. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's a big book to put in the names of the family and how old they are and who their parents are. And anyway, I came to the first boy. I said, what's your name? He said, Garland Jones. What grade are you in? Fifth grade. Uh, uh, then I, I said uh, to the next boy and I said, what's your name? Faye Jones, how old are you? Well, I'm, I think he's seven or eight, and he's in the third grade. So I came to this youngest boy, and he was a heavy set and the blondest hair I ever saw. But he had a, I never heard him speak till he opened his mouth in. He had a voice like a man. I said, what's your name? He said, Hootie Jones. I said, uh, Hootie, how old are you? Five years old. I said, Hootie, do you know your ABCs? Hell no, I ain't been here five minutes. <laughs> Uh, one of our, uh, this, this boy uh, didn't, uh, another little funny story, I don't have my notes here, that uh, he grew up and uh, he, uh, about 22 years old, I think, when he died. But anyway, I saw him at Kerbyville during the Depression days. And I said, who do you haven't seen you in a long time? How are you getting along? Oh, is that no good at all? Said, I growed up to be a man right in the middle of this Depression. I should have died when I was a baby. <laughs> Ozark Mountain philosophy. You know, uh, another wealthy man was building a home at Forsyth not too long ago, and we have a, a carpenter over there named Collins. And he's a farm boy and does carpentry on the side. He's a good carpenter and a good farmer and a good citizen. Well, they was working away and it comes some pretty, trying to finish this house. It came some pretty weather in March, and so Mr. Collins came up to this man who's building a big house. He said, I'd like to have about two days off he said, what do you mean two days off here? We're trying to finish this house. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to plant potatoes. He said, just a minute. He said, how many potatoes you plant? we're going to plant? And he told him, he said, you'll raise about 10 bushel. And you could buy 10 bushel of potatoes for 20-some dollars. And said, you lose three days work here, and you lose $30. He said, that don't look like some good sense to me. Well, he said, it may not be, but there just comes a time in these hills when us old boys have just got to plant our taters. <laughs> I, uh, I was prosecuting an uh, elderly lady for disturbing church in Forsyth. Well, Laura Johnson. Laura Johnson, she's a good old soul, but she had a high temper and she had to fuss and just broke up the Sunday school. And then I promised her when I was elected, if she did that, when I was prosecutor, I'd prosecute her, and we did. Anyway, we uh, tried the case and over at a schoolhouse, Union Flat, before old Bill Dennis, the just the peace. And so it was almost sundown when we got through, had a jury, and the judge said, uh, now I'm just going to give you boys 10 minutes on the side to argue this case, and Olin Wolf was defending him. So I just barely got started with my argument, and the judge said, Doug, your time's up. And this old lady said, yeah, said, sit down and shut up. Nobody wants to hear that anyhow. <laughs> I think about that, so I always remind myself of that when I make a speech, because people, they, you, you must have talked too long, and I won't do that today. Another one, uh, a story that uh, one of the Blankenship boys uh, met me on the street 
not too long ago. They're both dead now. And uh, he said, see, where are your woman? You and your woman's been on another trip. I said, yeah, we we took a little trip. Yeah, he said, I I never was very, he said, they told me off out in the Arizona one time, my kids did. He said, that's the furthest away I ever was from the sound of my own cowbell. <laughs> Uh, Wendy Bill Wright was a character that Emmett Adams knows well that he uh, knew him in his time and he was a he was named there was two Bill Wrights over in that country so they called him Wendy Bill and he was well named for that <laughs> but he was carrying the mail from uh, I suppose from Forsyth Emmett and I have discussed it and uh, the Forsyth to see mails and then up Beaver Creek to Hill uh, the, the miller was asking me about that well he, there was a store and Emmett Adams written a beautiful story about Hill for the mountaineer and uh, so he carried the mail up the hill and they wait a while and back to his emails, back to Forsyth. Well, they got in a poker game in the old uh, blacksmith shop up there and somebody turned them in before the grand jury and they were all indicted. <laughs> so they called uh, Wendy Bell in for the judge and Judge uh, John T. Moore was a kindly man and he, d he didn't uh, want to be too hard on anybody, but when Bell pled guilty, he said, Mr. Wright said, didn't you know it was against the law to gamble? said, yeah, Judge, I know it was again the law, but I didn't know the law wretched spur up his hill. <laughs> now I'm going to talk about, a little bit about our independence of our mountain people. There was uh, Uncle Mac Smith, a character who lived upon Swan Creek. And he uh, was having a lot of trouble with one of his neighbors. And him and his father was a prosecuting attorney at W.R. Riley Adams. So Uncle Mac Smith came in and complained to uh, Riley that uh, this man had, uh, was mistreating him and uh, actually took a shot at him. So he said he wanted to put him under a peace bond. Well, Mr. Adams had a little longer typewriter. He began to type away and type away. Pretty soon, Uncle Max Smith said, Riley, what are you doing there? He said, I'm typing up an affidavit. Affidavit for what? Well, you'll have to sign an affidavit that you're afraid of this man before we can put him under a peace bond. Afraid of him? I ain't no more fear to him than I am that little back house out there. <laughs> then, There was a, this story was given me by some boys from Southeast Missouri when I was in the legislature. There was a, a wealthy fellow in St. Louis had a, a plantation down on the Lower River and he invited some of his friends down there to go duck hunting and they uh, came a cold, cold rain and they all, and this uh, wealthy plantation owner said, let's go up to my tenant's house and let them fix some food and we'll, we'll have something to eat. So they got up there and the poor fellow didn't have any they'd eat very much and poorly furnished the house wasn't all and so this man was trying to sort of apologize for his tenant being in such a bad way and he said well my good man said uh, you don't have uh, very many dishes you don't have uh, very many chairs he said and you, your, your table is rather scant he said i got plenty of dishes i got plenty of chairs i got plenty to eat but i got too damn much company <laughs> My father lived to be 91, and he was a freighter in the early days from Kirbyville to Springfield for the store there. And, uh, I, we like to hear him tell the stories of the freighting days. And then after Mother passed away, he on a Sunday we'd go get him bring to our place to have Sunday dinner with us. And he lived alone till he died. But he, uh, anyway, we were, I was taking him home, and he lived in Power Cycle. We're pulling up that steep river hill, and there, there's a beautiful new truck ahead of us dump truck loaded with sand and I said uh, dad see that big truck for that sand yeah I said uh, boy it have, how many wagons and teams would have taken in your day to haul that much sand we got along all right nobody wanted that much sand in them days <laughs> <laughs> then uh, I lived like I told you with Mr. Booth down on Bee Creek and taught the rural school when I was 17 years old 
18 later in the year. And uh, he was full of these good stories. And he's talking about how sharp our people were. He said, they, they mistake our people. He said, even a half with them would get the best of you. He said, I had a boy working from him. He wasn't very smart. And he's a, we were the clown. And at night, we'd uh, feed the mules corn. And then we'd turn them out on the grass to graze the night. And said, one of these mules is hard to catch, so we put a little strap on his front foot and a little chain on it, and that way he couldn't run, we could catch him. So to keep the, so the dew wouldn't cause that strap to rub and make this, get the legs sore, some of you old timer go, why they change it about, knife about, one, one leg, one front foot, one evening, and on the next evening on the other. But Lum said, I told him to go down to feed the mules, and then after he got through eating, to turn them out. And I said, be sure and put that chain on the mule's foot and put it on the right hand, right foot tonight, be sure. He'd come back after a while and I said, I knew he couldn't tell his right hand was left, but I said, well, did you put the chain on the mule? He said, yep. I said, which foot did you put it on? He said, he studied and said, I put it on the one next to the care flock by God. <laughs> This same Wendy Bill Wright I was telling you about, uh, when Hitler invaded uh, the European countries and started the war, there was a, I was county clerk, there was a great, there was a group of fellows sitting in the county clerk's office talking about the war and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and all that. And Wendy Bill was an old man then, pale blue eyed, a little thin, white mustache. And he said, now fellas, he said, they always have fit over Yenner and they always win. And I just wish sometime that our states would had to take a little advice from Wendy Bill. And he illustrated with his story. That when I was a little boy over on Beaver Creek playing around in the yard, said Grand Paul was sitting on the porch and the neighbor come a rushing up, riding up on a mule just held for leather. And he said, all that Grand Paul said, old man, the hawk, your hawk's is in my cornfield. And Grand Paul just kept a smoking and a rocking and said, that's all right, neighbor, said there's hawks in cornfields when I was a little boy. <laughs> Well, one more story about Wendy Bill. Uh, some of the boys here, some fellows in this room used to go to the harvest fields because there's no money to make in Taney County and work of any kind. And so they'd go out to Kansas and those German farms and work through the harvest. Sometimes they had no cars in those early days. They'd uh, bum a ride on the train or they'd go to Chadwick and buy a ticket. Anyway, they'd, Wendy Bill decided to try his luck at one of the harvest fields. So he landed in Kansas, walking down the road, and here's this beautiful farm and his harvest and his wheat. He went up to where the crew was working and got a job. And after the old German farmer went on towards the house, why these, uh, one of these other workers said, you're not going to like it here at all. He said, you know, said, uh, they've had, he, he butchered hogs here in the summertime and said, we've been having a hog liver every day ever since. Wendy Bell said, well, he said, and of course he wasn't a minister, he wasn't even a Christian, I suppose, but he said, uh, we'll fix that. He said, you tell this fellow that I'm a minister of the gospel and like to ask the blessing at noon time. And this is a little sacrilegious, but this is what we say in the hills actually happened. So they got in at noon and they told the old German that this fellow was a minister and like to ask the blessing. So Wendy Bell said, all bow your heads, please said, Dear Lord, we're thankful for what we're about to receive, but if there's anything I hate and despise, it's hog liver and these damned flies. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, that didn't stop the flies, but they didn't have any more hog liver. <laughs> the same character that I was telling you about, uh, Lum Booth, uh, I, uh, after third term of school, I thought there I had a little T-model Ford with a truck bed on it, Lum and I'd run up and down the creek squirrel hunting and fishing. He just loved that little car, first car he's ever in, first car I ever owned. Anyway, later then, I got up in the world a little as a county clerk. 32, I bought a Chevrolet and had that freewheeling and all that fancy stuff. The freewheeling didn't work except to just run away with you. Well, Lum came to town on his horse one day, and I was proud of the new car, and I said, Lum, I'll take you ride in the new car. So we got in, rode up the top of the hill around, got back. He got out of the car and he walked all around it and looked at it. He said, well, that's a pretty car. 
But I like your old car the best. Said there's too damn many fixings on this car. The more fixings he has on anything, the more after it is to get out of fix. <laughs> and that's true, you know, we had a Maytag washer for years and years. And I could take a pair of pliers, a screwdriver, just about to fix it. But now if something goes wrong with our washing machine, we've got to send to Springfield or somewhere to get somebody to even look at it. And another thing Lum Booth said to me one time, they, uh, Lum was a fiddler and he played for the square dancers in the community. We had those square dancers in the homes in those days. And uh, they were always orderly and no problems, no trouble. But over in Arkansas, just across the line, they had some pretty wild dances. Well, I broke away one night and went over to one of those square dances in Arkansas. Well, the next morning, uh, we was drinking a coffee there. He was a bachelor, of course, and his wife had died. There was two of us there sitting drinking a coffee. He said, now, young feller, said, You're, uh, you can come and go as you want to now, but said, teaching this school here and everything, said, I don't know whether you really ought to go over to Arkansas to them wild dancers or not. He said, you know you never ought to have nothing to do with nobody that's any honor in you. <laughs> Then uh, the same Uncle Mac Smith I was telling you about, uh, he, his son, Sant, had caught a bunch of fur, fur hides, we call them, and they had them stored in the smokehouse, and someone stole them. And they were having a trial. The man was accused of stealing these fur hides. And Bert Hayes was a noted cross-examiner, and he was defending this man, and he started to cross-examine Uncle Mac Smith. Uncle Mac Smith was a big, raw, old man sitting in a witness chair, and. Uh, so uh, Bert pointed his finger at him and said, Mac Smith said, you didn't see this man steal these fur hides, did you? Hell no, didn't see him. If it had seen him, they wouldn't be having no lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> when Bob Gideon was first elected to the bench, he uh, uh, was trying uh, a case in Christian County, and the, uh, one of the witnesses was Chester Carnog, and Chester drank some in those days, and maybe never did quit for sure, I don't know. But anyhow, he, he was, he approached the witness chair on, on unsteady feet, took his old big broad brim hat off, and took the oath, and sat down, and they asked him a question or two, and he was so intoxicated he could hardly answer the question. So Bob said, just a moment, said, Mr. Carnog, are you intoxicated? Of course, the boy knew him, you know, they just grew up together. He said, what did you say, Judge? He said, I asked if you were intoxicated. He said, Judge, do you mean am I drunk? Bob said, that's what I mean. He said, Judge, that's the best darn decision you've made since you've been on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> I was representing uh, Andy Youngblood for, in, for a workers' compensation commissioner in Forsyth. And he was driving a truck at a tomato factory over at Stone County. I got to include all these counties here. He's over in Stone County in this deal for George Dodge and the truck went off of the, the road and hit a tree and broke his finger. Uh, this finger on his left hand. So uh, we put the evidence in and uh, Judge, Judge Powell was a commissioner at that time. It's now Circuit Judge of Springfield. Mm -hmm. No, he was the attorney uh, for the insurance company and uh, this Judge Newton was the judge. Anyway, they got through and they had the chart there and showed it. And uh, the judge said, well, I said, are you right or left hand? He said, I'm left hand, right hand. He said, that's a minor figure on a minor hand. He said, that's not too serious. So uh, Mr. Powell said, we'll pay you $100. I didn't know what to say until the old Andy Youngblood, he said, now, judge said, for a lot of people said that would be a minor finger on a minor hand, all right. But said, I'm a violinist, and that's my main noting finger. He said, uh, I'd go down to the Harrison Fair and usually won first or second place. But said, since I broke that finger, all I ever won was a little old chocolate cake. <laughs> and the uh, pal said, that's a $100 speech. We'll give you $200. <laughs> well, I'll hurry along here. You're kind to me. We're, we're taking too long here. But uh, Uncle Will Shandle was had the ferry boat and the, the Moore's Ferry before they built the big lake. And uh, his son, grandson, Harold Handel, was bank boy. He was bank. But 
during the Second World War, a writer for the Post-Dispatch came to Taney County and interviewed Uncle Sally and uh, Uncle Wilson and Aunt Sally. And then he went back and he had some fine pictures of her churning on the porch and on the ferry boat and all. Well, uh, then the story he wrote, though, was rather degrading to the to the people of our area. It just didn't it just treat us as though we were hillbillies and this and uh, this wasn't the facts at all. Well, anyway, after the article came out, when I saw Uncle Wills over in the courtyard, and I went down and shook hands with him, I said, Wills, I read the story and saw uh, in the Post-Dispatch about you and Aunt Sally, and, and it was a nice story. And so he said, well, Doug said the pictures was all right, but that, that story wasn't right at all. He said, they just let on like we don't even know the war's going on. To go and to have to wait a day or two for our meal and then it'd take two or three days to come home. So we'd camp at night and us boys would pull blue stem grass to feed the oxen. And I was busy sort and I said, well, it's a lot better than that now. I can drive over there in an hour. He looked out the window and he said, young man, if I knowed where there's another country like it, I'd start in the morning. <clears throat> and Mr. Daly from Denver used to come to Forsyth Fish and visit for many years and then uh, I tell you this it's not the hills or the streams or the blue skies that really make the Ozarks it was the people the people and this was such a good illustration of it what Mr. Daly the railroader from Denver he was he'd come to stay at our lodge and so one time he he said Doug I, don't, I won't be coming back anymore he said I thought it was this White River and Swan Creek and Beaver that attracted me in the mountains but said, I found out it's the people. He said, the ones I knew when I first came, started coming here are all gone now. And he said, I won't be coming back anymore. He said, it was the people that I learned to love so much. <clears throat> so uh, now I want to talk just a little bit about Uncle John Hilsenbeck, the fellow who kept the hotel at Forsyth. He and his wife kept the old Northside Hotel. And Uncle John, every sentence that he began in his conversation was, I say, I say, regardless of what he, that's the way he started his sentence out. So uh, one instance was that uh, Forsyth got along without a church for many, many years. And then about 18 and 80, they, they had two saloons and plenty of stores, liver bar and all, but they decided to build a church. So they built the church, a little stone chapel that stood there until the dam was built. And that stone is here on the campus of School of the Ozarks now from the little church. But they built the church, and then some fellow, Uncle John liked his drinks real well, and he visited old saloons regularly. And so this uh, fellow said, Uncle John, said, uh, Colonel Ford, the lawyer, has been looking up the law, and we built the church too close to the saloon. I say, I say, they'll just have to move the church. <laughs> <laughs> then his, uh, his wife was a hard worker, and they kept, and the hotel was a, really a busy place in those days. The, the railroad came as far as Chadwick. It wasn't in the railroad in France. And the hack would drive from Forsyth and meet the railroad train, the passenger train in Chadwick, bring them down, and there'd be land speculators, people looking for land they'd bought, the uh, people interested in mining. There was a lot of mining in the county of Melvin in those days. Uh, the, uh, the court people, the Judge uh, Neville from Springfield would come down to hold court and other judges, Judge Hubbard to, from Springfield. Uh, we were in the same judicial circuit with Greene County. Well, these great crowd of people at the hotel and Miss Hills effect was have to feed them all to cook on the wood range. So one day, the hot day, and she was working away, and she said, Hilsebeck, we're out of wood for the for the stove. Said, you ain't worth nothing at all. You ain't worth anything around here at all. He said, I say, I say, old woman, if it wasn't for me, what would you do for fish? <laughs> and I tell these newcomers, I said, now you want to remember about Uncle John, your wife wants you to cut the lawn or fix the fence or do something, but you can just tell her that you've got some fishing to do. So Now, uh, this, uh, I'm going to close now, this little, you've been real patient with me, and I, I uh, appreciate getting to do this. Now, there's no history in this, it's sort of like, our next president said it's sort of the trivia of the Ozarks, but it's the spirit of the people that I, I love so much. And I tried to portray it in the little book I wrote and it'll be continued on in this second book. Now, 
Among the people who visited the north side of the hotel was Judge Neville from Springfield. He liked a little drink, and Uncle John liked a little drink, and they struck up a great acquaintance. They both liked to fish. And so uh, Uncle John would uh, persuade the judge to go fishing in spite of maybe having court. Well, there was a young man by the name of Flowers staying at the hotel and teaching school. And he wrote this sweet little verse about uh, Uncle John and the judge. And uh, I wouldn't have had that except for him and Adams' his brother, Wilson, had it. And he typed it off for me and gave it to me. And I, as uh, far as I know, no one else had any copy of that. And I always have appreciated him for Wilton giving me that little poem. And this, he had watched the uh, Judge Devil and Uncle John uh, in their activities of having to drink and go and fishing. So he penned this sweet little verse, and this, and this I, with this I will close, and thank you again for asking me to come. When Uncle John Hilsebeck said, I say, I say, the fish bite fine in Swan today, the judge well knew what his duty was, in spite of the court, in spite of the laws. I say, I say, I was down at dawn to a quiet hole on the banks of Swan, and the prettiest trout you ever did see are awaiting their judge for you and me. That settled the case. No court that day, as Uncle John knew in his sly old way. And something they'd take along to ward off chills and cure snake bites and other ills. As down through the trees they went their way, you'd hear faint echoes, I say, I say. Occasional laughter, a shout, a song, told where they fished the morning long. And the fun they had, you'll never know, unless you were there in that long ago. Unless you knew the judge and John in those good old days on the banks of Swamp. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Lucille punched me and said just exactly what I was thinking. She said every one of those stories reminds me of one that I know. And I'm sure that each one of you sat there and, and were reminded. In fact, I thought I'd just have to get up and tell you, Doug, a new one that I heard the other day. Uh, Vernon, Mabel, um, Leonard Burke was telling me a new one the other day. And you know, Democrats were kind of scarce up in, our, up in Booger County too. We kind of run them out or shot them off or something. There weren't too many of them around anyway. So during Depression days, when a group was working uh, on, they started the courthouse, and they were doing, it was a June or a July day, and it was terribly hot. Leonard said they were down digging and were, oh, just, you know, just hot as they could be, and one man crawled out and sat down on the side of the, of the ditch, and he said, you know, I reckon I ought to be glad that I've got a job. And I reckon I ought to appreciate that Democrat president that we've got that started a little work for us, and we're making 40 cents an hour. But he said, I tell you what, when I sit here and I think about how hot I am, and I think about him up in Washington, D.C., and said, I'll bet you if the truth was known, there's an electric fan in every room, and he has cheese and crackers for supper every night of the world, and said, when I think of him up there wallowing that luxury, I really can't appreciate what I've got down here. <laughs> so, and then Doug mentioned the old schools. Uh, you know, your Springfield paper car carried some stories of lice, you know. And we had a school in Douglas County that we called Laos Level. I don't think it had any other name. It was Laos Level. Well, we were talking about the lice this winter during the school term, and I mentioned this to some of our young, innocent teachers, and they really thought I was pulling their leg. They didn't think that, you know, that this could really... But there was a louse level now. We had, you know, really. So as Doug told the stories, I'm sure it made each one of you think of stories. And Doug, we did enjoy it and appreciate it so much. And I saw him sticking back a few notes. We didn't get all of them. So I could listen to more of that, couldn't you? That may not be history, but that's what I cut my teeth on, and that's what I want my kids to know. And this is what I'm afraid that we're losing, too. So we must preserve this. It means a lot to us. Bill, did you have... 
Why don't you come to the mic, Bill? I don't, can you hear him? Oh, you're going to ask Doug Mankey to tell us. Come on, Doug, we're not tired. money, even with three dollars. Now we do pay the School of the Ozarks for publishing, for printing the magazine. The reason sometimes it's late is we kind of get pushed around because though we pay them the actual cost, I'm sure, they, they certainly do not get the money from us that they, they get when they do publishing for other firms when they're doing, I suppose you'd call it industrial publishing. So I just wanted to remind you that I think we might be a, a little grateful for that, but don't forget this, they're getting good advertising too. It's good public relations for them because we use a picture of the, co of the college always on the magazine. Now, I should like to make a motion that we hold our next meeting at the School of the Ozarks. I would like to have made a motion that we hold our meetings from here on at the School of the Ozarks because I think there is no nicer place that we can come for the price we pay, which is the price that means that everybody who wants to come can come. But we felt, uh, I talked this over with Sunita, and she felt like that maybe that wouldn't be quite a fair thing. But I should now like to move that we hold the next meeting at the School of the Ozarks. A second for the motion. Yes, I do appreciate getting to meet here, and certainly there's no place we could get such fine food and such good service for the money. 
uh, as I told Jewel, I personally, and of course Lucille, I'm out, this is your and your committee's decision, but it, it is sort of centrally located, it's easy to get here, and yet I think there are times that maybe we individual counties maybe would like to do something special. I know when we had you up to Douglas County for, you know, for Mr. Hibbert's memorial, we certainly enjoyed it. And we are going to have another one sometime in Douglas County. We're going to have a, a Doc Gentry memorial, and we want you all to come to that. But really, I know of no better place to have our meetings than this. And as far as I know, then we are adjourned today, and we'll see you all back sometime. Okay. Do I hear a motion that we adjourn for today? Oh, we didn't mo motion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here I thought I was out. You know, as president. Yes, we had a motion and a second, and we haven't voted. All in favor, let's let it be known by yay. Yes. And the opposed by nay. The motion carried. So we'll. I will uh, drop the Davidsons a note of appreciation for today's meeting then. Now, does anyone else have anything or have we left any loose ends? There was. Uh, it came from Taney County. Yeah, this is Bill Melton, the star player for the White Sox. Chicago. He's Hickman Melton's grandson. Oh, yes. Daisy. Daisy and Hickman. I never Hickman. knew Hickman Melton, but I knew of him. Oh, well, he, he's lived here class in the Daisy. And this boy's name is what now? Well, this boy's Bill. Bill Melton. Boy, those bad fans. How many gyms was there? there? Black that's gym, what crazy I'm gym. <laughs> yeah, black gym and crazy that's, gym. That's what I'm working on. It's a Van now. Now, was Tom Van